famous prophet named David Wilkerson wrote a book about prophecy that would happen in the world. And um, he said in that book that uh, one nation in Europe would become bankrupt and then that would be followed by a Latin American country. And that two weeks after the fall of the nation's finances in Europe, two weeks later, America's finances would fall. Now, I don't know, um, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm telling you this, uh, David Wilkerson's prophecies have been very accurate in the past. And this week, Europe, in Europe, Greece, their financial economy fell. It's a very big deal. If you have watched the news, you will see it. Also, uh, now he says in his prophecy, because I went online and looked it up again, he says Mexico's economy will crash. And, uh, but uh, Greece's economy has already crashed. And what that means is Greece was borrowing money, borrowing money, borrowing money from other nations, and they couldn't pay it back. And so what happened was the other nations in Europe, they were borrowing money from Spain, from France, from England. They were borrowing money. Those countries decided they're not going to give them any more money. So then the government of Greece can't pay its bills. So that means the people who get money from the government in Greece will not be paid. Now, you think about yourself if you get money from the government of the United States. This, if the economy of the United States crashes, it will impact you and me because I'm on Social Security. So it will impact me. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, David Wilkerson said, after the European... Uh, financial crash happens, then in America it will happen in two weeks. And he says there will be six months of time after that two-week period, there will be six months of very hard times in America. And then America will kind of rebound. So uh, I'm not telling you what you should do, but I'm just letting you know. I went to the store this week and I bought uh, an extra 25 pound bag of rice. I already have some saved, saved up that I've put back through the years, but I decided if times are really going to get hard, I want to eat. <laughs> so uh, I'm just giving you this information, let you think about it. You do what you feel you should do. But I don't want to stand here and know things, and I don't tell you because I don't want to scare you, and I don't tell you. And then if it happens and you're just like, not prepare, that, that would be my fault. You know, so I want to uh, prepare you. Um, what, what happened in Greece is uh, the banks took a vacation for it. The, the government fell, the banks closed for a certain time. And now, it's my understanding in Greece that people can only withdraw 66 euros a day. And that's just a little bit of money. You imagine if you could only spend $66 a day. You know, that's just a little bit of money. Hard to survive on that. Hard to live on that. So uh, just to let you know what's happening in the prophetic world and let you think about it and decide what you want to do. So those two things, 
The alignment of the Bethlehem star is tonight. We will go out and look at that, and that will be wonderful. You know, it makes me think, if the star came uh, to announce Jesus coming the first time, Maybe the star is coming back to announce his coming the second time. So um, we are looking, thinking, planning. Come, Lord Jesus. Last week I talked about pride. You remember? I'm going to. Um, <clears throat> pride is a disgrace. It embarrasses you. When you have pride, it embarrasses you. At the time, you feel all proud, but then later, after the time has passed, of feeling all proud, and you start thinking about it, you're embarrassed that you showed your pride to other people. So tonight we're going to talk for a little bit about the balance between pride and humility. Because if, you know, pride is over here on one end, humility is way over here on the other end, but if you go too far this way, guess what happens? It like circles around and you become proud of your humility. <laughs> Say, oh, I'm humble and I'm proud that I'm humble. You know, those things are not good. So we're going to talk about how to balance between pride and humility and have the kind of humility that God wants us to have. In the moment that God is using you for something wonderful, always point to him. That kind of humility is 100% acceptable and right. Second, let God make his own declaration. Don't advance yourself. What does that mean? That means when you do something really wonderful for God, you don't have to tell people uh, that God used you, but you can expect that God's going to have someone else praise what you did. You know, uh, when God works through his people, he doesn't keep it secret. If God kept it secret, we would not know about the miracles of Peter. We would not know about the miracles of John. We would not know about the miracles of Paul if God kept miracles secret. So when God does a miracle through you, you can expect God to thank you. You know, if you do something for someone, don't you expect them to say thank you? Sure, you do. And if they don't say thank you, you go out, oh. I worked and worked hard for them, and they didn't even thank me. Well, our God is not selfish, and when we allow his spirit to move through us and miracles happen, he always says thank you. And most of the time, that thank you is public, so people know it. So don't be embarrassed when God says thank you. What do we do when people tell us thank you? We just say, you're welcome. So we just say to God, when he says thank you to us, you're welcome. You're welcome. 
I was thrilled that it happened through me. So there's a difference in being thrilled that it happened through you and being proud that it happened through you. Um, proud people put other people down. Okay? Our church, Pastor Fred and I, we are very proud of our church inside our hearts. We're proud of you. But we don't stand up and say, our church is the only church that's doing God's work. When you see someone saying, our church is the only church doing God's work, we're the only church that is right, that is pride. Because there are many, many churches all over the United States where the people are doing wonderful things for God. There are many, many churches that have kept faithful to the word of God. There are many, many churches where the people are praying. There are many churches where the people are witnessing. There are many churches where the worship is wonderful. So we don't allow, like, traveling preachers who come here and stand, like recently, last Sunday, our preacher that came here and stood and preached, we, we told her before she stood here, we don't allow visiting preachers to criticize other churches here. We don't criticize other churches here. We don't point, point, and tell you what's wrong with them. Even if we don't agree with their doctrine. Even if we know something is wrong at that church, we don't criticize them. That's not God's plan. Yeah. No comparing, comparing, comparing here. That's what we told uh, Jen. We said, we don't have many rules. You can be flexible. You can be free to do what God has burdened your heart. And when that message was awesome about the love of the Father for you, that was awesome Sunday. But we said we have one rule, no criticizing other preachers or churches. That's our one rule. You know, don't let pride puff you up to make you think you're better than all other Christians. We are all in the process of growing and developing and trying to improve and trying to let God transform us by his spirit. And all of the brothers and sisters who are true brothers and sisters in Christ are the same. <clears throat> but don't be surprised when someone comes up to you and says, I've heard your church. I've heard about your church and says something good because God advertises his children. It's like on Facebook. You always know the mothers, you know, the mothers always are putting up pictures of their children, pictures of their children, pictures of their children. You know, God loves to show his children Say, these people are being used by me. I'm working in this group of people. They're hungry for my word, whatever. The balance. Guard against false humility. That's humility that's way, 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 way too humble for God. We're going to talk about that. Too much humility. False humility is feeling proud inside, but acting like it's nothing on the outside. And then someone says, oh, it was so good. It blessed me so much. You go, Nothing, nothing. But inside feeling. No. That's false, false humility. 
Yeah. We have to be careful about false humility because false humility is deception and deception is sin. We say, you know, God did it all. You know, but for example, our fireworks stand out there. It's like, I believe that God has blessed this church with that fireworks stand every year because it's a financial help to us. And he wants our finances to be easy and not tight. So he helps us through that. But guess what? Did God come today and set up that stand for us? No. They came and helped set up the stand for us. And Belinda came and Blake came and um, Paul and Rachel came and Mariah came and Sarah uh, Hostetler came and my, my granddaughters came to help, to work. You know, God allows us to have that stand and it seems like every year our church, we get it. Not everyone gets it every year, but it seems like God makes sure our church gets that every year and it's such a blessing to our finances. But God didn't come down here and set up that stand for us. God allowed his children to be active and involved in what he wants us to do. So <clears throat> we thank God that he makes it possible for us to have the fireworks stand every year. But we also thank the people who work on the stand and we proclaim their names. Why? Because we want them to know we are proud of them. And we want them to feel good that they did work for the church because the church belongs to God. And when people work for the church, they're working for God. Excessive humility is refusing to allow God to work through you because you might become proud. Okay? I heard a person t tell me one time, a person told me one time, I don't want God to make me rich because I'm afraid if I became rich, I would not serve him. I was like, what? I would serve God rich or poor. If God made me rich, I would serve him. I'm not going to tell God, God, keep me poor so I can serve you. I'm telling God, God, if I become rich or if I stay poor, it makes no difference. I will serve you. See, I have committed to serve God no matter what happens. I have committed to serve God if I have a place to live or I don't have a place to live. You know, I have committed to belong to him. Now, I will just tell you, all of you who are here tonight, right now, if there was an awful crash of the economy and you found yourself not able to pay your rent and you had no place to live and you were going to have to go out and be homeless, you will always have a place in this building. We can put sleeping bags on the floor and sleep if we needed to. We could. Now the city might not like it. We might have to go to court. 
but you have paid for this building with your tithe and your offering. You keep the lights on in here. You know, you will always have this house, this place to come. Not, you know, we will not swing the door open for every person on the street to come in. Oh, he says Tuesday night people only. <laughs> but you understand, it's like God plans, has a plan to take care of his children. There's a verse in the Old Testament that has always intrigued me. It says, draw near to me, talking about God, this is God talking, I will draw near to you. The sad thing about our world is that people out there don't want to have anything to do with God until they need help, and then they want to draw near to him and get his riches. Yeah. You know, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> there's something wrong with that. Um, Okay, let's, let's go on beyond that. You should be excited when God uses you for the miraculous. It's not your power, but it was your willingness to pray, to believe, to obey. You opened up the channel for God to flow through. If you are shut, God will not flow. If you have lifestyle sin, what does that mean? That means sin that is ongoing. You repeat the same sin over and over and over and over. And you have not done, done what you must do to get rid of it. Because guess what? God delivers, but God expects you and me to stay away from sin. If I know there's people that drag me into sin, God expects me to stay away from them. God expects me to break those relationships. God expects me to say honestly, I love you, I care about you, but I can't be with you because you drag me the wrong way. And then, T-H-E-E-N-D, the end. The end. No more. You know, hanging around with a bunch of people that have the same problem you have is a big mistake. If you want to be strong in the Lord, get with strong in the Lord people and stay there. Because we are all competitive, right? We are all competitive. What that mean? If I see you, you know, I know these boys back here. It's like if they see one, one of their brothers eating three hot dogs, they're going to eat three hot dogs because I can eat equal to him. Right? See, that's that competition. I have competition with my own brother and sister still, and we, we are like all over 65. But we get together, we still have competition. You know, it's in our character to compete. So if we're around people who are strong in the Lord, we will grow strong. There's just something about that. It pushes us forward. 
if we get and we hang around a bunch of people who are weak, we're going to be weak just like them. Because they're going to fall down and they're going to say, oh, come on with me, come on with me. And I'm just going to feel pressured to do the wrong thing. It says, draw near to God. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. That's the beauty of God. Be excited, not ashamed. When God uses you, be excited, don't be ashamed. You don't have to boast, but be excited. And when someone says to you, I notice that you are a wonderful, you know, Worship leader, you are a wonderful worship leader. Don't say, oh, no, 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 that other person is better than me. I can't lead. Say, thank you. It is by the grace of God that I have been given the skill to lead worship. Don't say, oh, oh, oh I, I can't, no, no, you know, it's like, No. That is over-the-top humility, and God doesn't expect that. Because what happens? If God gave you a gift and you say, no, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, it means you don't believe that God gave you a gift. But God did. The other person already saw it. See, the other person saw the gift of God that God gave to you, and now you're denying it. No, 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 not me, not me, not me. And God is saying, yes, I did give you. Too much humility does not honor God, just like too much pride does not honor God. It's the same thing. If God touches someone's heart and they want to give you a thousand dollars, don't say, oh, no, 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 no. I can't accept that from you. You know, even though you owe your credit cards, you can't pay, you have school debt, or you have a, a car note or you have a house note that you're struggling to stay in your house or whatever, and God is answering your prayers, God, help me, help me, help me, and someone tries to give it to you, and you go, oh, no, 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 I couldn't accept that. And God is like frustrated. He says, I thought you prayed and asked for help. I sent help, and you won't accept it. Do we do that to God? That is too much humility. Say to the person who is offering, thank you very much. You don't know how much this means to me. I have been praying and you are my answer to prayer. And then thank God. Then thank God. God did that. Because no one just gives money away for the fun of it. We are all just a little bit selfish. We all like to keep our money. But when God taps us and says give, most of us are willing. And most of us give. If you are the giver and you give and give and give and give, God is going to give back to you. He will. Don't put your hand in God's face when he tries to give. God wants you to be excited about what he has done through you and through your brothers and sisters in Christ. I have to tell you I'm excited about what God's done because my sister went to uh, 
her doctor today and had an MRI and all the tumors in her lungs and in her brain have all decreased in size. So I'm very happy about that. They're not gone yet, but I'm expecting God to erase those tumors. I am expecting that. Uh, my husband tells me I have 10 minutes, so we're going to proceed. Be excited, not ashamed. Rejoice. Learn to rejoice with each other. I've been watching this new, well, this program that's on TV, I've been watching it. It's called The Briefcase. Have any of you seen this? Yeah. The Briefcase? The Briefcase. Have any of you seen it? Well, they choose two needy families with lots of debt, lots of bills, lots of problems, and one person goes to one of the families, another person goes to the other family, and they give them each a briefcase with $101,000 in it. And they have um, 72 hours, three days, to decide what to do with the money. They can keep all of it. They can keep part of it and give part of it to someone else who might have more need than them, or give all of it away. The thing is, these two families don't know that both of them got $100,000. Yeah, 101, 101,000. And, but... The needy family that they show is the other family. So first, first, the, they choose one of the couple, they're couples. So they choose one of the couples and say, you go to the bank, you deposit the money you want to keep for your family, and you bring home in the suitcase the money you want to give to the other family. And they choose one on the other side, same thing. So then when they come home, they have to show their husband or their wife, this is how much I decided. Well, you people who are married know that husband and wife, there's always one generous and there's always one safe, safe, safe for a rainy day person. See, so, you know, sometimes they, they put it all in their bank and keep all, and they bring the suitcase home, they show their spouse it's empty. And their spouse, who is a giver, they were like, they look at that empty suitcase and go, what? You're not giving them anything? They might be needy like us. You know, and it's just like, it's very interesting. So then they, they explain a little bit about the other family. You know, they explain a little bit about their needs and a little bit about their needs. And then the opposite spouse goes to the bank and has a chance to change what the first one decided. See? And then they go and visit each other's homes to see how needy that family really, really is. And they, they can look all through their house. They can look at their bills. They can look at their, their rooms, their closets, whatever, their refrigerator. They can look and look and look. And then from there, they go and face each other with the suitcase, how much money they want to give. It's very interesting. Very interesting to watch these people struggle, struggle with giving. Some, it's no problem. We will give all. And some, they're just like, we're keeping 80,000. We're giving them 20,000. Our need is worse than their need. Some are like equal, 50,000, 50,000. And in the end, Whatever they give, it's locked in. They can't change it. See, 
God gives to us. And God wants us to be generous. You know, you can think, well, if both gave all, then they would both end up with 100000 each. But what happens if one gives 50000 to them, but they give all to them? They end up with fifty, and these end up who were selfish end up with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. See, now, 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 all of you are going to go home and look on your TV to see if you can find it, because it's very interesting. It's very intriguing. But here's my point with this story: God gives us all something. He gives us gifts of different kinds and he wants us to use our gifts for the benefit of others. But I watched this the other night and one couple gave <clears throat> um, 20000 kept 80000 The other couple gave 11000 And they wrote a note. Because this couple was living together and they weren't married, and this couple didn't like that idea. So they said, we're giving you 11000 but understand, we want you to get married. You've been living together for nine years. You have three children. It's time for you to get married. No. So it's like, but it's like, I noticed something. No matter how much they get, no matter how much they give, at the end, they all embrace and tell each other thank you. That's all God wants from us. When God gives us, he just wants us to be thankful. And when our brother or sister in Christ gives to us, he just wants us to receive it and be thankful. Just to receive it and say thank you. Not too much humility, oh no, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't accept from you. Not too much pride, I'm so proud I gave them something. Find the balance in God's ways. Find the balance in God's ways because God is an awesome God with great balance. Great balance in his ways. God loves us. Excited, rejoicing together. When someone gives to you, accept it. Take their hands and say, God, you know how much this means to me that my sister in Christ or my brother in Christ has given me this. I know it came from you through them. I'm asking you to pour out a blessing on them so that we can rejoice together in your name. Pray for them. You can't do anything better for someone than to pray for them. That's the top thing you can do for someone. Pray for them. Be honest about how you feel. You know, just say. You know, most of the time when God tells you to give to someone, to bless someone, you don't know why. You don't know what they need. You just feel in your heart, I need to give that person something. And when you obey God and you do that and you give, you know, then the other person who receives should be honest and say, you know, you don't know how much this means to me right now. I really needed this. This is really going to help me. Be honest about it. I am amazed and excited about what God just did. Now, when we lay hands and it's a miracle, we say, I'm amazed and excited about what God just did. I'm thrilled that God worked through me. There's nothing wrong with that. 
There's nothing wrong with being thrilled that God used you. I'm thrilled that I was able to help you. These people who are worldly people that are exchanging this money in the end, they always embrace, and they're, we're thrilled that we helped you. <laughs> we're thrilled that we were able to give to you. We've never had enough money before to be able to give to others. But now we have experienced the thrill of giving. Doesn't matter if it's big or if it's small. Think about how much thrill you get out of giving those $1 bills on Sunday to our youth, our kids, for camp. That's a thrill. That thrills me every Sunday. Every Sunday when I see those kids running around getting those dollars and bringing them up, it's a thrill to me every week. You know why? Because I'm excited for the kids to be able to go to camp and because I'm excited for the generosity that you have in your heart for that. I'm excited at the love you have for our kids and our teens. I'm excited for the generosity that God has put in you. If I begin to take credit for what God is doing, please tell me. That's what I'm telling you. If ever it appears to you that I am taking credit for what God is doing around here, just tell me, Pastor Cruz, I think you're not giving God enough glory. We need to help each other. And maybe if we see our brother or sister in Christ being too humble, we need to just encourage them and say, wait a minute, God is using you, or God is giving to you. Don't put your hand in God's face. Just receive. God has something for you to do. Now, I know we all heard Pastor Fred's timer, but I told him 8.05, and my computer says 8.02 right now, and it's not dark out yet, so I, I will keep watching. Okay. Let's not take the credit for what God is doing. Let's be sure that God gets plenty of praise. Let's be sure that God gets plenty of praise that we advertise his great name. Let's be sure that God is honored among us. Let's be sure that God is promoted among us. Let's be sure. Our God is an awesome God. And he loves every one of us to the max. When no one else is still loving you, God will still be loving you. That's why he sent Jesus to die for us. That's why he gave the greatest gift and we have accepted that gift. And we said, Jesus, I accept the price you paid for my sins. I accept that. So, also, let us accept love from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us accept love. Because it's God's love flowing through their open pipe so that they're able to demonstrate love. How? By feeding you, by taking you out for coffee. Sometimes we show love just by sitting down and talking to someone. 
Sometimes we show love by giving them a ride. You know, if they walk here and it's light in the evening before service begins and they walk here, they might need a ride home. It's dark after we finish. But God, help us. God, help us to be the kind of people who love, just like Jesus loved. God, help us not to be afraid to allow his power to move through us. What happens if you lay hands on, on someone and you pray for them and their miracle doesn't happen? Are you going to be embarrassed? No. You're only the pipe. If God doesn't pour anything in your pipe, it's not your fault, unless you have the pipe closed. And if you have the pipe closed, you're not going to lay hands anyway. You're telling God, not me, not me, not me, someone else, someone else, someone else. Your pipe is closed. But if your pipe is open and God doesn't pour through you, it's not your fault. It's God's choice. Maybe that person that you laid hands on and prayed for Maybe their pipe was closed. Maybe they didn't believe. Or maybe it was open, open, and God said, wait. The time is not yet. You know how long the people waited for Jesus to appear as Savior of Israel? That was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. The seed of woman will bruise the serpent's head. And it didn't happen for thousands of years before Jesus died on the cross and his blood dripped down on the ground and bruised the head of the serpent. Thousands of years the people waited and waited and waited. And something else that we know, for 400 years, right before Jesus was born, there was no prophetic voice, no one preaching. Prophets, no preaching prophets, 400 years, from the last book of the Old Testament to the first book of the New Testament when the baby was born. 400 years of silence. If it feels like to you that God has recently been very silent, when you pray and pray and pray and it seems like God is silent, he's hearing you. The time of Christ is soon. I really believe that with all of my heart. The time of Christ is soon. Exactly when? I don't know. The Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. But to me, if the Bethlehem star is appearing tonight, and it is, first time in 2,000 years, then... We might need to get ready. We might need to get ready and to make sure that everything in our heart is like he wants it to be. I'm going to pass out these papers that explains all about the Bethlehem star. This information came out of um, the University of Indiana. Indiana University put out this information. The information about the Bethlehem star, uh, I showed you the video before, came out of NASA. They're saying the same thing that this university is saying. This is the world talking about the Bethlehem star. The church needs to know about it. (laughs) If the world knows about the Bethlehem star and we don't know, there's something wrong. (laughs) So uh, I'm giving you the information. We're going to go outside. 
We're going to look for it. It's going to be in the western sky, uh, sky, right out here. It should be to the west, and it should the those two planets, Jupiter and Venus, should be rising together tonight, and they will merge like this and become uh, one very bright star. So we're going to see it. It's going to happen at 8.08 and it's 8.09 right now. So we're going to go out. I'm going to give you these papers. And after we see that, we'll join hands. We'll pray together in closing. 